Um, so much going on that we'd like to plumb your, your thoughts about. Not surprisingly, while lawmakers discuss relief packages, conservatives are raising the alarm about the national debt. Our next guest is economist Dean Baker. He says that those alarms are outsized and their concern is based on misinformation. Dean Baker co-founded the Center for Economic and Policy Research in 1999. He uh, among other things, he wrote the book Rigged, How Globalization and the Rules of the Modern Economy Were Structured to Make the Rich Richer. You were right in that book, just the title. And your blog, Beat the Press, provides commentary on economic reporting. Dean, thanks for joining us this morning. Well, thanks a lot for having me on. Good to be here. Can you talk about the classic anti-debt arguments and why they are flawed? Yeah, so we're, we're going to see a lot of these, and we're already getting some of those. I, I wrote that piece in response to, a, to my view, an absolutely horrible uh, article in the Washington Post. Then after I wrote it, someone sent me a link, and I saw the New York Times had one that was almost as bad. But anyhow. Shocking. <laughs> shocking, yes. Um, anyhow, so, so the classic story is that if we're spending a lot of money, the government's spending a lot of money, we're running a large deficit, but that's gonna drive up interest rates. It's gonna crowd out investment for the future. And that's a bad story. I mean, if that's true, that's a bad story because investment is driving productivity growth. In other words, investment, get, we get new equipment, new research and development that will make us richer in the future. And if we don't have that, if we're not investing because interest rates are real high, then we won't be as wealthy as we otherwise would be. So it's crowding out, it's making our future worse off. That's a, the conventional story. Then in addition to that, we get this story about the debt where because we have a high debt, the story goes, we're paying all this interest to, to people who own the debt. Now, this is often made a generational thing. So old timers like me are supposed to feel guilty that, you know, we're getting the interest on the debt and, you know, our kids or grandchildren are going to be paying it. The, the basic problem with that story is, well, at some point we're all going to be dead. We meaning the people are alive today. I don't want to give anyone bad news, but that's some, some sooner rather than later, as it turns <laughs> out. Rather than later with the coronavirus, maybe much sooner. But in any case. Um, Dean, I'm going to ask you quickly just to back off from your computer a tiny bit because I want to be able to see your whole. Okay. Yeah. So anyhow, so so the, the point I was going to make with that is that at some point we're all going to be gone. The people who are alive today are all going to be gone. People who are paying interest on the debt are paying to other people who are alive at the time. In other words, it's an intragenerational thing. So I understand most people aren't going to own a lot of government bonds. And their children and grandchildren aren't going to own a lot of government bonds, but they're not going to be paying interest to the people who are dead. They're going to be paying interest to the descendants of Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and other rich people. So that's an intragenerational story, which could be a problem. It has little to do with the debt. I mean, if we're upset that you know Bill Gates and Bezos' grandchildren are going to be hugely rich and everyone else is going to be poor, well, we should tax their their grandchildren. <laughs> but but you know that's not intergenerational. That's intra. But anyhow, the, the basic point that I made in that piece was that even that story doesn't really hold water for the simple reason that what we're actually paying in interest on the debt is actually very low. So even though our, our debt is large relative to GDP, that's indisputable, it's historically very high, because interest rates are very low, the burden's actually not a big deal. We're paying much less in interest on the debt now than we did in, in the 1990s. And I also point out, my recollection, 1990s were actually a pretty good decade, you know, certainly the second half of that in terms of the economy. So there's really just not much of a story there. We have all these people running around like chickens with their heads cut off going, oh, my God, the debt, the debt, the debt. And you go, OK, calm down. Let's see what your story is. There is really not much there. Dean, are they are they using this idea of the debt, to, uh, the national debt, to uh, make arguments such as Mitch McConnell made the other day that we should, in, instead of occurring debt on the federal level, we should let states go bankrupt? Absolutely, and it's incredibly pernicious. I mean, they were not concerned about the debt one iota when they had the big corporate tax cut a few years ago when uh, this was uh, Trump came in there and said we're going to cut corporate taxes, and then a huge corporate tax cut, somewhere in the order of one point eight trillion over the course of a decade. Um, they weren't concerned at all about that. And when they did the first phase of this bailout, they weren't concerned at all. Now, when we're saying, "Oh, you know, look at this, we have all these state and local governments 
their revenue has gone through the floor for obvious reasons. They, they we're, we shut down the economy. No one's paying sales taxes. No one's paying income taxes. So it's not it's not like they did something wrong. We've shut down the economy, and of course, demands for their services are going through the roof. That they're they're paying for healthcare, of course, and many other services that they wouldn't ordinarily have to pay for. So yeah, they really have big budget problems. So here we have Mitch McConnell going, oh, just got the pensions. And I have to say, this is a little bit personal for me. My mother's a retired public sector worker. She Same worked McConnell. for her pension. Mm-hmm. So where does Mitch McConnell say, we're going to take your pension away? Why don't we go to people who, you know, Donald Trump, I'm sure at one point or another, bought land from the city of New York, city of New York or the state of New York. Why don't we just take it from him and go, hey, we don't have enough money. I mean, th- this is- Well, we might. For those pensions. <laughs> so, exactly. you know, this is- yeah, so this is a total garbage story that Mitch McConnell is using to take money from people he doesn't like, public sector workers. How, how, can you talk about where you actually may have seen some, I find the independent media is the only place where you can see some of these economic arguments uh, being made. There, It doesn't seem like the New York Times, the Washington Post, our mainstream outlets are even letting an iota of an idea that that the you know someone's pension is actually theirs the money that they paid into it um are you seeing any you know are you seeing any very, evidence? very little you know it's you know the washington post in particular has just been uh you know horrible they 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 have been uh you know i, I i'm hesitant to use the word jihad because of its its uh, negative connotation anti-islamic connotations i should say but, you know, they've been on war, the war against public sector workers and pensions for a long time. And New York Times hasn't really been much better. You know, they've they've uh, had any number of stories that have hugely exaggerated the problems of the public sector pension funds. And there are problems. Let me be clear. There are many states. Um, Illinois, where I'm from, is has a serious problem with its pension fund. There's some others I could point to. But most of them were reasonably responsible. And again, one of the, the points, as I say, People work for this. They weren't given gifts. They work for them. So it's like after you work for it, they're saying, oh, no, no, we can't afford what we were supposed to pay you. That's a little bit outrageous. But the other part of the story, and this is, again, just kind of infuriating because I see it so many times in papers like The Washington Post, The New York Times. And just to be clear, I pick on them because they're considered the best. You know, so I'm not like trying to find, understand a reporter for the. You can just understand that the New York Post is not going to do an accurate depiction or the Daily News, which is owned by the Kushners, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so, and also, you know, to be fair, they don't have people assigned to it. They don't have a reporter that has a full time beat looking at the public sector budgets or whatever, which these, these papers in the New York Times and Washington Post do. They don't, they, they hugely exaggerate the size of the pensions. I remember once the Washington Post had a big front page article talking about California pensions. And the poster child was this guy who was getting something like 400000 a year in, in public pensions. And, you know, you look at that and go, wow, that's kind of outrageous. Well, when you read through the piece, you had to look to the jump, you know, which was a full page. You found out that the person who was their poster child was actually not an ordinary worker. He was a city manager who had given himself four different positions and was under indictment for fraud. So this was not in any way characteristic of California's public sector workers and their pensions. The other little trick that, again, just, you know, it just kind of, it's, you know, a level of incompetence or whatever you want to say. Many public sector employees are not covered by Social Security. That's true. The the workers, uh, I was talking about Illinois, they're not covered by Social Security. So you see that their average pension for Chicago uh, city workers or Illinois state workers, it's somewhere around 30, 33, 34. Well, if you're thinking, well, someone's getting 15, 20,000 a year in Social Security and they're getting 30, that, that's pretty good. But they're not getting 15,000 from Social Security. All they're getting is their 30,000 pension, which, OK, fine. That's not horrible. That's where a lot of retirees have. But you can't say someone who's living on 30, 35,000 a year in their retirement is living the good life. So that might be enough to make ends meet and get by, and that's great. But that's not a luxurious pension. Uh, Dean, what can you paint a little bit of a picture of what an economy would our economy uh, would look like when old people don't have pensions anymore? What does that What does that do if you know? People have to do what Mitch McConnell is suggesting. States have to do, and they gut yeah, the pension funds. What are we looking at? I mean, people are already in bread lines that that are stretching out for miles. 
No, it's 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 a pretty awful story. And, you know, these again, I mean, I understand I'm not saying poor people should be in that situation. But, you know, these are you know, people who work their whole lives, 30, 25, 30, 35 years. You know, they thought they had a secure retirement. And suddenly you're telling them, oh, no, you know, I don't think they'll come to zero. But, you know, you could see very substantial cuts in their pensions. Many people, of course, when they hit retirement age, still have a mortgage to pay if they own a house. They're struggling with rent. So you're going to see a lot of people who maybe today are able to make ends meet, maybe even have a little bit extra, but suddenly they won't be able to. And they're going to be in very desperate situations. Many of them will, of course, turn to family members. Maybe they'll move in with their kids. I mean, they, you know, people do that. Um, but it's not it's not a situation you'd like to see. And again, you know, I'm not saying it's okay for poor people, but these were people who were middle class, they worked and they thought they had a secure retirement. And suddenly we're telling them, oh no, uh, Mitch McConnell doesn't think he should be able to, to live that way. Um, can you talk about why conservatives are feigning concern about the national debt? Who benefits here? Well, they suddenly get the concern when we're talking about helping out state and local governments, public sector workers. Um, so it's that that's when they suddenly decide they're concerned about the national debt. When it was a question of, you know, as I said, the tax cuts to corporations, they, they didn't talk about the national debt, you know, or they said utter nonsense. This is going to pay for itself. If anyone really believed that, they should be removed from office because it was so nutty. In the latest stimulus bill, isn't there a, a caveat that says the money that goes to states cannot be used for, say, firefighters or police or, you know, other frontline workers in that capacity? There's restrictions on that. Yeah. And that, this is another part of the story that, you know, we have loose states, to put it loosely, um, more liberal states that have better public services, New York, California, Illinois. Um, it tends to be the case that more liberal states have spent more money in education, more money in their university systems, more generous uh, poverty programs. So uh, the, the Medicaid, they, they all have Medicaid, uh, extend, they extended Medicaid, you know, through the Affordable Care Act. So they have a more extensive social welfare state than, say, a state like Mississippi or Alabama. And McConnell and the Republicans would very much like to change that. And They've been, you know, this isn't new, by the way. So you go back to 2009. I was, I remember being a little struck by this because when Obama came out with his stimulus package just after he took office, he had a lot of money in there for state and local governments. And then he had to negotiate because they had the filibuster in the Senate and he had to pull along, I forget, two Republicans or three Republicans. I think it was three. Anyhow, he had to work on getting their support. And in doing that, he had to cut back the money for state and local governments. So I was going like, I thought Republicans like state and local, you know, they're always talking about yeah, really, they're always talking about states rights and leaving it up to the states. Yeah. So I was going like, what's going on? And then one of my friends said, they're trying to dismantle their welfare. They, they want to make it more difficult for California and New York to pay for their, their university systems, for their public schools, for their more generous uh, welfare benefits. They want to make that more difficult and cut their workers pay. So that that's what it was about. And then in, in, in 2017, again, this didn't get near the attention that deserved. I think it was a really big deal. They camped the 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 deduction for state and local income taxes on people's tax returns. Now people said, oh, well, that goes to rich people. It does. But the point was this was this was hitting rich people in blue states. It didn't affect rich people in Texas. You're just talking about that. Yes, exactly. So, so so that was an effort to again make it more difficult for California and New York and other how did he do that exactly? Make it more difficult for can you Give me a little bit more detail on how. Yeah, so, so the point is California, I'll take them because they're the extreme case here. They're, they have a tax if you're a high income earner, let's say it's over a million. I can't guarantee the exact cutoff, but we'll say it's over a million. You're going to pay 13% income tax on everything you earn over a million. Now, before that used to be deductible on your federal income taxes. So you're in a 40%, I'm using a rough number here. So you're in a 40% tax bracket. So that means that I, I earn $10 million, we'll say $10 million over that $1 million. So I owe the state of California $1.3 million in taxes. Okay, But then I go to the federal government and I go, oh, I paid $1.3 million in taxes. I could deduct that. So then it only means I deduct 40% of that. So then I end up saving about 500000 on my federal income taxes. So that means I only paid about seven, uh, 800000 which is a roundabout way to have the federal government 
support state. Subsidize the state. That's right. That's right. And how so, did he cut that for red states and not or blue states and not red states? Because red states red don't states do that. States don't have big income taxes on rich people. Because so, red people hate taxes. <laughs> well, they hate taxes on rich people. So they have sales yeah. taxes. They have other taxes that low and moderate income people are going to pay. Rich people pay them too, but they don't pay the same. They're not. It doesn't uh, hit them hard, quite as hard. hard. Person is not paying five, six, seven hundred thousand in sales taxes in Alabama and Mississippi. The, uh, wow. I, I mean, I, you know, we call Trump an idiot, but it seems like this is a work of uh, genius at, uh, that he's trying to starve the blue states. Yeah. Well, what he's in on, who knows? He's obviously not upset by it. McConnell is very devious and he understands very well what he's doing. And it's quite. I won't say explicit, although it's close to explicit. I mean, he said they should declare bankruptcy. That gets pretty close to explicit. Um, it's, you know, this is about starving blue states. And people don't understand that. We're in a war and you're acting like, oh, I, I don't know anything. They're shooting, you know, they're lobbing the artillery shells and we're acting like, oh, we don't notice anything. This is a war. They're trying to, they're trying to, to take advantage of this pandemic to totally nail the blue states. Do you see uh, what would be a solution that blue states could do? I see interstate compacts happening on the West Coast, on the East Coast. And I've been talking on this show about, you know, what's the, an interstate compact against a federal government that that certainly smacks of you know the di a dissolution of uh, the united part of the united states uh what do you think that staying within the context of the country that we have now uh states could do to to counter this well there, there's a couple stories i mean first off part of what the blue states have been doing and there's some red states included on this as well is just coordinating efforts dealing with the pandemic which you know, again, it's outrageous. The federal government is just derelict in not doing that. But you've had, you know, the the states in the Midwest, for example, Illinois, uh, Michigan, they're, they're, they're blue states, Wisconsin, but they're coordinating with uh, the governor of Ohio, who's a Republican, you know, fairly sane. I'm not going to endorse him for re-election or anything, but he's, he's, he's at least been able to take the pandemic seriously. Um, and same thing in the, the Northeast, where you've had uh, governors, uh, Baker, the governor of uh, Massachusetts, and Hogan, the governor of uh, Maryland, both uh, Republicans, but they've been coordinating. Um, so you can have interstate coordination like that. And it's really absolutely essential. I mean, that should be done at the federal level. Trump's not doing it for whatever reason, but you know that's that's absolutely essential. But in terms of getting the money from the federal government, um, that's you know I Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi is very astute politician, and she's been running things for the Democrats for a long time and managed to get a lot of legislation through. But it's absolutely mind boggling to me how she let these bills go through that the Republicans really wanted. They absolutely wanted and they were needed. I mean, they absolutely wanted these last two bills to go through without having substantial aid for state and local governments. Just kind of mind boggling to me how she could do that. So, you know, she's saying, well, you know, or her defenders, I should say, well, it's hard. She couldn't get everything she wanted. Well, this was kind of a really big thing. You know, and she's been giving uh, interviews with reporters saying, well, I'm going to fight on the next one. I hope so. But, you know, I don't I don't know they want the next one that much. They're certainly giving every indication that they don't care. Now, that could change. But, you know, I, I think it, it certainly seemed to me she had much more leverage on the last two bills than she'll have on the next one. Um, we have questions coming in from the chat from Touring News. What is going to happen in the municipal bond market with the $500 billion Fed Reserve backstop with requirements on uh, county or city size? And what would it mean for states to declare bankruptcy? And my question added onto that is, can you explain what he's asking about in that question? Because <laughs> yeah, well, perhaps the... not everyone is going to know. Yeah, well, one of the stories here has not gotten as much attention. Maybe it's good it hasn't. Uh, Jerome Powell, who's the chair of the Fed, uh, created a, a special lending facilities for, for state and local governments. It only applies to large local governments. I think something like 13 around the country qualified. So it does apply to all of the states, though. And it allowed them to buy up, in effect, the Fed to buy up their bonds for periods of two years. Previously, they'd only held, couldn't hold municipal debt. I think it was 30 days. It might have been 90. But in any case, very short term. And that was hugely important because right now you're getting a situation where I'm sure many state and local governments literally don't have money in the bank. 
So it's a question, okay, how are you going to pay those people working in hospitals dealing with all these people who are infected with the coronavirus? You don't have money in the bank. Well, now they can at least have money in the bank to get through that. Now, this isn't, these are loans, they're not grants. So they do have to come up with the money to pay it back. But for this week, next week or whatever, that means at least these New York, New York City, Illinois, these other uh, states that are really severely strapped, they could get through that. So that was hugely important. And, you know, it, it was great that he did it. And he's talked about extending it. So it might go to some of the smaller cities. Again, as I was saying, it was, I think, 13. I won't swear by that number, but most cities in the country don't qualify. So that, that's a really, really big deal. Now, in terms of bankruptcy, basically what that means is you renegotiate all their contracts, all their debts. So one of the debts, we talked about this, uh, public pensions. So those will be on the chopping block. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with, the city of Detroit went bankrupt, I think it was seven, eight years ago now, and their workers took a big hit on their pensions. So presumably if uh, New York City, New York State, whoever you know, are, is in McConnell's sites, if they have to go bankrupt, their workers will take a big hit on their pensions. Also, all the contracts are up for renegotiation. So uh, the teachers, you know, all the other employees of the state. Uh, Dean, state you're making me really mad. <laughs> You should be really mad. I mean, this is these are people, you know, they have in their sights, they can't stand, the Republicans can't stand the idea that someone could work as a teacher or maybe even the custodian of the school. They could have a middle class standard of living. It, they hate that. And, you know, that goes beyond just the Republicans. I was talking before about the New York Times, Washington Post. I remember back in the 09 bailout, the Washington Post was going nuts because auto workers were getting I won't swear by the exact number, but I think it was $28 an hour. And they literally were saying that. Imagine that, an auto worker getting $28 an hour. That'd be a little more today in today's dollars. But still, this is a middle class living standard. This is not someone who could have, you know, uh, lavish vacations, second homes on the Sias, um, uh, Riviera. You know, this is a middle class living standard. But they were absolutely out. You know, they were saying this openly. So it's not my attributing motives to them. They were saying this. They were outraged the idea that an auto worker could have a middle class living standard. And that's what you see going on with a lot of the, you know, the McConnell people. And, you know, I think a lot of people are even Democrats. Like, where does a custodian get off having a middle class living standard? Oh, I, we have to get all these people out. <laughs> All of them, all at once. That's me. I know you're an economist. I don't know if you take positions on that, but some I of the- try to be calmer, but I have similar <laughs> thoughts. My job is to be mad. <laughs> yeah. um, another question coming in, uh, by the way, people in the chat are thanking you and we thank you for coming on. Uh, one final question, although it might lead to, to more talking, is uh, what would you say that there is any value to considering the debt to GDP ratios? And if so, to what extent should countries actually care about them? Um, I'll try not to get off too far on this. Um, I don't think there's much value to answer the question because it, it ends up being an arbitrary number. It is reasonable to ask about the debt surplus. And that was the issue I was giving before. How much money do we have to pay out to the people who own the debt each year? Because that, that is a burden. I mean, that means, you know, if we're paying one and a half percent interest on the debt to, to I keep picking on Bill Gates here, but whatever, you know, they, he's my stand in for rich people today. Okay. So that that's money we don't have for other purposes. That's a burden. But one of the points I've made on this, and it actually took me a while to come around to my thinking, and maybe I shouldn't be frustrated that no one else seems to share it, but I'm very confident in my position. Um, we have much, much larger debts that no one even talks about. So we're going to spend 500 billion this year on farm, uh, on prescription drugs. If we snapped our fingers and got rid of all patent protection, everything sold as a cheap generic, anyone could come into the market and sell it, we'd almost certainly spend less than $100 billion. So that difference, we're spending $500 billion, we'd spend $100 billion in the cheap generic world. The difference is $400 billion, almost 2% of the, the economy. All right, well, that's a form of government debt, because where did they get the patents? Where, did, where does Pfizer get a patent monopoly? Well, the government gave it to them. That's how we pay them for doing research and development. Now, we could argue that's a good thing or bad thing. I don't I, I mean, I do care. But, you know, but the point is, this is just a logical issue here. We're letting them charge an extra four hundred billion dollars a year because we gave them a monopoly on these drugs. 
As no a wife of a scientist, I'd also like to point out that a lot of the science is actually funded, uh, you know, by our tax dollars and not because the, the pharmaceutical industry foot the bill for the for the, for the uh, research. So that needs to be put in there too. Tax funded research given to, taken by pharmaceutical industry, uh, tweaked a little bit, gotten a patent and then making billions of dollars off the backs of, uh, you know, Americans. It's just insane. That's, that's entirely right. And we're seeing this, you know, like front and center in, in the, this pandemic, uh, there, there was, it looks like it may not pan out for a while. There was this little flurry that the drug Remsevir, uh, which is, I think it was Gilead that has it. I, I might be, might have my drug companies wrong no, here, Novartis. Right. But anyhow, it doesn't matter. Um, that was developed in 2009 as a treatment for Ebola. It turned out not to be effective. But in any case, it was a very large amount of government money in the development. And suddenly they're saying, oh, it looks like this might be effective against the coronavirus. And wow, we're going to be incredibly rich. <laughs> well, wait a second. We paid a ton for that research. Now, I'm sure the company, whichever one, I can't remember who it was now. A lot, I but, think it was. Yeah. Yeah. That, that they did put in money, but we put in an awful lot of that. And yeah, if they know, put in some and we put in a lot, why don't we could just split it percentage wise? I mean, well, we don't have is, to have, you, know, you know, I would just have it. I mean, there's two points here. One is we have a collective problem. We should be looking to have all this open sourced. And some of that is going on now. It's a great thing. There's stories about this, that scientists who are in many cases working for drug companies, they're putting everything they're doing on the web, which is exactly what we'd want. So researchers all over the world could see, oh, this is promising. Let's see what we could do. Or maybe this is a dead end. You want to know that too. Don't waste your time. So they're open sourcing things that aren't ordinarily open sourced. And then if we pay for it up front, let's pay for it all. I, I'm fine. I understand they do testing. Pay for the testing. And then at the end of the day, it will be available as a cheap generic. And we don't have to play games. Absolutely. Dean Baker, thanks for joining us. It's too long between your joinings uh, of us. Um... <laughs> well, I'm happy to come on. I, I guess I'll see you again next month. Yes, we'll see you again next month. I think we're moving you from Friday to a different day. I hope that still works, but Alana will Yeah, be no, that should be fun. So I'll see you. I think it's a Monday. So Well, thank you so much. And thanks for all the work you do. You could find, uh, you know, Dean Baker is a senior economist at the Center for Economic and Policy Re Research. Don't forget to read his uh, Beat the Press blog. It, 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 it will set you straight. And uh, it's the kind of thing you can send to people. Uh, so that you can set them straight without having to explain it yourself. Thanks again, Dean. I appreciate you coming on here. Thanks for having me on. You're watching Act TV. If you're watching on YouTube, please click the subscribe button and uh, be part of our YouTube community. Obviously, you can see our page is growing. We do uh, interviews. We do all kinds of educational, uh, progressive things on this channel. So please like, uh, subscribe, share, send to your friends, post on your Facebook if Facebook still lets you put up YouTube videos. Um, and we'll see you next week.